uh, professional insurance, professional indemnity insurance, and also insurance for commercial uh, properties. I will start with the insurance for commercial properties. We will look at a, a certain documentary on uh, fire insurance, and then we will look at the uh, professional indemnity uh, as a policy. And then we also looked at a case study, and then we can have a section for a Q and A. So with the fire insurance or insurance for commercial properties, there is a provision in the Insurance Act which makes it uh, mandatory that if you have a commercial property, you are supposed to have insurance. If you put up a commercial property, you are supposed to have the fire and allied perils insurance for it. And, and also insurance for third party liability. That's uh, injury to persons, and then damage to a third party uh, properties. So you can have an insurance for the commercial uh, property or the commercial building that's whilst it's being constructed. And then also when it's been, it's been completed and it's being used. So you can have the insurance for both at the construction stage, and then also when it has been completed. So we have insurance for building under construction, and then also insurance for building that is already in existence. So it's, and then we have, besides the insurance covering the, the property, we also have insurance that covers the third party liability. Like I mentioned, that's we usually call it the public uh, liability insurance. And it is by law that when you are putting up a building, you are supposed to have insurance to cover the fire and the allied perils, and then also the third party liability. Usually in insurance language, when we talk of allied perils, we are saying that anything that can cause damage to the building or to the property besides fire is termed as allied perils. It could be windstorm, it could be flood, it could be earthquake, it, it could be explosion, it could be um, an aircraft damage that will cause uh, these uh, damage to the building or the property. So we term all these as allied uh, perils. But then the, the basic one is what we call fire. So we say fire and then the allied uh, perils. We have the, uh, the 2006, the Insurance Act, uh, 724. We have sections 183 and 184, which uh, makes it mandatory to have insurance for these properties and also for the third parties that might, may be involved in the event of any uh, disaster. So usually when you take the insurance for such uh, properties, you are supposed to add the third party uh, liability. And like I said, the third party liability covers death, injury, and then also a property damage. For instance, if there is, a, a, let's say, a gas explosion and it spreads into adjoining properties, these are third party properties. But then where it's involved human beings, we say it is uh, to a uh, third party injury 
or death or disease. So those ones, those are the third party that are involved. It could be a property or it could be injury or death to a person. So that's what the uh, insurance uh, really uh, uh, covers. I would like us to look at the uh, inventory now. Yeah.
Mr. Ansundenchi, if you can hear me, there's no sound to your video. So if you can please talk us through it. Hello, Ms. Ansundenchi. Yes, madam. We can't hear anything on your video. So if you can please talk us through it. There's no sound to the video. Oh, okay. Is, can we hear now? We can hear now. You may have to start the video again, please. Okay, so Mr. Sodeji, we're still having problems with the sound. So if you can, please just talk us through the video. Okay, okay. So uh, I, I'll do. So uh, basically, the the video that we're watching was back down to the documentary on uh, the fire uh, insurance for commercial buildings. As uh, the uh, section 183, 184 of the 2006, that's Act 724 of the Insurance Act, uh, it makes it mandatory to have uh, insurance for such uh, commercial properties when they are being put up or when they are in existence. And in insurance uh, terms, the insurance for such properties comes, sometimes we, we talk about insurance for commercial properties. Some insurance language talks about uh, contractors or risks for a property that is being uh, put up. And for the uh, contractors or risks, it covers building that is under construction or any property that is under construction. It could be a road, it could be a building, it could be a bridge. Once it's under construction, we usually have what we call the contractor's or risk insurance, and it covers any loss or damage to the construction, that is the property that is being put up. And it usually have two main sections. We call the section one, the material damage section, that's uh, damage or loss to the works itself. And then the section two talks about the, the public liability. That's liability to third parties. It could be injury to third parties, or it could be a third party property damage. So this was to give highlights on how these insurances comes about for uh, commercial properties. There is this insurance bill, uh, insurance bill uh, does uh, for the year 2020, I'm sure very, very soon that will come out. And it even extends to government properties uh, as well. All these properties are supposed to have insurances either under construction or the property is already in existence. So we have insurance for the property and then the third party uh, liability uh, insurance. Usually the, the third party liabilities where it involves exclusions and the like, it affects third party properties as well as injury to third parties. So when one is taking the liability limits, 
what I mean by limit is that the, the amount of indemnity or the amount of compensation that one will have to uh, pay or the insurance will have to pay for such cover, if it's out of exclusion, usually the amounts are supposed to be quite high so as to be able to uh, address all those who will be affected by such uh, liabilities or such uh, distractions. So it's very important. I wanted to uh, touch on these fire and allied perils uh, insurance policies. And then I would uh, go on to the uh, professional indemnity uh, insurance that we would like to uh, discuss. Now I would start by saying that the 2002 uh, insurance bill has a uh, process that's uh, 216 to 223. But basically the 218 and the 216 uh, provide for professional indemnity insurance. Mr. And, Denchi. Yes, please. Can you please minimize your video and increase the video of the screen rather? Oh, okay. We want to see what's on the screen. When you when you click on it, that should be bigger. Is your is your okay now? It's perfect. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so the on the insurance bill, that's the clauses 218 and 219, provides for a professional indemnity insurance. And the clause 218 requires an employer of a professional person uh, specified in the column of the second schedule shall ensure and maintain insurance under any qualifying professional indemnity insurance contract with a licensed insurer. So in the insurance bill, there are several professionals that have been mentioned. Among them is the architect. So that's why I brought out these. And then the, the clause provides for the scope of cover of a professional indemnity insurance that's a professional indemnity insurance contract is required to indemnify the insured professional against the liability of professional person for loss or damage caused to another person where the claim arises from a particular matter stated. I would like to read some of the, some of the insuring clauses under the uh, 219, that's the clause 219 in, in, in detail. It talks about the liability of the professional person for the loss or damage caused to another person where the claim arises from a negligent act, error or omission, a negligent misstatement or misrepresentation or a breach of a duty of care in connection with the carrying on by the person of the business. The dishonesty of the employees of the insured professional or persons engaged under a contract for services and in the case of a, a body corporate, the directors of the body corporate or the laws or theft of documents and data, including the cost of replacement, the reinstatement of data, and the increased cost of working. The legal and other costs connected with defending a claim referred to in the item that I mentioned, and then also the cost of investigating and settling such a claim. That's 
this aspect talks about the legal when it goes to court and there it has a legal implication the cost of in, investigating and settling a claim and then also in defending a claim are all covered it comes in in the in the insurance language this comes uh, as a form of what we call the insuring process that the items that you can specifically insure so in effect we are, we are saying that you are supposed to cover for the professional negligence in the cost of your work. An architect, let's say, puts up a building and it comes out with, uh, with, with drawing and then a contractor puts out the, the building. Usually the architect becomes the, uh, the leading team consultants on the project and it, it, it takes recommendations for uh, execution of work that is being done by other specific bodies. Like for instance, if we, we take some, someone like a contractor, a contractor uh, puts up the building, but then the architects look at what the contractor had put up, whether it's in line with the drawings or it's in line with the specifications of the conditions of the contract, all these are looked at, but then when there is any uh, negligence on the part of the work that have been that have been done, because the architect might be the leader of the of the team, he will be called to address any liability that may arise from the work that have been or the projects that have been uh, put up or executed. So where the uh, architects had uh, taken a professional indemnity policy to cover any liability that may arise from the project that is being put up, then the professional indemnity insurance will come into, into play. So that's why uh, I've read the, the clause 218 and then 219. And then the other aspect uh, is, uh, I know in one of the, the questions that came, uh, that came up were uh, asked how uh, the essence or how professional indemnity insurance can be uh, incorporated in the uh, conditions of contracts. That's, the uh, the uh, how do you call it the architects puts up that's how to have such clauses in the, the contract agreements. So for the conditions of contracts, if I, I can make a provision that the consultants or the lead uh, architect is supposed to have a professional indemnity to cover any professional negligence in the course of the project. And it's supposed to be a cover that will last up to the end of the project because some projects will probably take about, uh, let's say uh, 36 months, that's two, three years or two years and the like. This is an, an, it's an annual policy and it's subject to a renewable. So year on year basis, the policy can be renewed so that it will always be in force up to the time that the project uh, will be completed. So you can put in a clause that make provision for the architect to take a professional indemnity insurance to cover any liability or any negligence on the part of the work that uh, the architects have done. That is why I, when I was mentioning the insuring uh, process, that's the liabilities that may arise from uh, taking the professional indemnity policy. We, we are, I spoke about the negligent act, error or omission, a negligent misstatement or representation or a breach of duty of care in connection with the carrying on by the person of the business and also 
where there is dishonesty of the employees of the insured professional and persons engaged under a contract or services in the case of a body of a corporate that the directors of the body of the corporate uh, organization. And then we spoke about, I spoke about the loss of documents, the legal expenses, and then the cost of investigating and settling uh, such a claim. So the, you can take uh, an insurance policy that will address these as specifics as insuring courses under the, uh, 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 prof uh, the professional indemnity uh, policy uh, for the architects. Next slide. I, I brought up some uh, aspect that relates to other professionals like doctors where uh, usually uh, a doctor, they, they bring an action against a doctor for certain professional uh, negligence in the in their, in their course of their work. And then they bring an action against them. All these relates to uh, professional indemnity uh, insurance that one can take. In certain projects, the employer or the client could ask that you should take a professional indemnity to a particular team. Uh, let's say sometimes they could, they could say up to about 50% uh, of the uh, contract sum or the full contract sum or a certain percentage that will be uh, acceptable to the uh, clients to take that uh, policy for the whole uh, project period and is to uh, cover the, the negligence on the part of the, of the architects. So that is what uh, we have to uh, take note of as to how much we are supposed to uh, take. Usually comes from the uh, employer and then the nature of the work that is being uh, done. So we can talk about a uh, negligent act, error or omission, breach of duty, uh, civil liability, uh, contractual liability uh, that is not caused by uh, negligent. All these are related to the uh, professional indemnity insurance that uh, professional architect is supposed to uh, take. Again, uh, I have on the, on the slide that I have, there is a, a case study uh, of um, a project that uh, an employer or a client in uh, Australia uh, contracted an, an architect and a, a contractor to put up some renovation, renovation work. And uh, usually as it's done by uh, the contract conditions for a project of this nature, the contractors, uh, consultants, let me say the, uh, the QS of the contractor would uh, recommend for work that they've done. And then the architect will have to certify for uh, payments to be done to the uh, contractor. So there is this uh, case study where the contract was awarded to a contractor which was being supervised by uh, an architect. And in the course of the, of the work, there was a damage to a slab. There was a very a big uh, damage to the, to the slab that was constructed. Also, there were doors and windows that had certain uh, defects. But then the work was uh, certified by an, an architect and the contractor was paid. 
So at the, at the time that the, the client was taking over the object, uh, was taking over the project and they detected some of these uh, defects, they, they brought an action. Uh, they, they sued an architect for $1 million for not uh, supervising the work uh, properly and the contractors were paid for work that were defective. So they brought uh, an action against the architect. But then if you read through the, uh, this uh, case study, there was some provision for uh, insurance, but then the provision for the insurance wasn't adequate to meet the the liabilities that had arisen from the, the project. For instance, whilst the, uh, the client was asking for $1 million uh, for uh, liabilities or for negligence, the insurance cover that they had was about $200,000, uh, which means that even if you take uh, $1 million, then there's, there was a shortfall of about $800,000 uh, dollars that couldn't be accounted for. So when such things happen and let's say it goes to court and it can be ascertained that there was a real negligence on the part of the of the party, then it means that whatever difference thereof will have to be um, addressed or have to be paid by the uh, by the architects. So that's, that's about this uh, particular uh, uh, case study. But then uh, what, what it means is that it was through the uh, certi certification from the uh, architect that those, those payments were, were done. But then if it is something that could be, could be challenged, you could still uh, uh, challenge and then see how they can put up uh, those defense. So this is just in, in, in effect, the what really happened when uh, the a contractor was paid over uh, $920,000 for a property that was bought for almost $1.5 million by the uh, clients and then gave it out for a renovation a certain a specification. And out of that, uh, the contractor by name Revolution Builders uh, PTY Limited uh, was paid 917,539 for that uh, two, let me say, stake payments. And later on, it was detected that there was uh, certain things that were not done. Sounds like uh, there was no uh, whether whether proof membranes that were put on the on the building. That's for the windows and the doors, and then uh, the 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 slab. And then there was a large crack in the in the slab, and that the suspending uh, concrete slab also had some uh, de uh, defects. As well as the the frames, and then the uh, some external works were were not done. So in in effect, I, I brought this as a, a case study, which I would also uh, share uh, with you probably after uh, this uh, uh, meeting. But it's a case from uh, Australia, which uh, I picked. It and I wanted to uh, share with you so that at least it could be uh, one of the of the areas that can uh, be an example for us to uh, look at. You know, in in certain uh, areas, it could be uh, argued that if an action is brought against an, an architect and it was the contractor who put up uh, the building. Uh, what also happens to the uh, contractor that uh, these works were done by 
him and this defense were detected. But then, you know, in a building team, because the architect is the, is the, is the leader, recommendations will be, will be made, but then the onus is on the, on the, on the leader to uh, be certain that what is being uh, called for, uh, there is uh, work that have been done to that effect that is asking for uh, payments uh, so that uh, it, it can be looked at. Uh, at a certain areas, one could say that uh, was those things detected after the completion of the project? Uh, was it within the defects and liability period that the contractor could be called to make good any defects on the on the project before, uh, let, let's say, um, final uh, handing over to the client? But then if you look at this particular case, it is, it is a project that have, that have been handed over and these defects were were detected. So it means that we need to uh, look at some of these things very uh, tolerant in the course of our uh, work. In, in some of the, uh, the cases, I, I came across uh, certain questions like uh, to give education and advice of professional indemnity for instance, how to have such process in our contract agreement, which I'm, I made mention of. If it is uh, for commercial building, you can refer to the insurance uh, clause or the bill, and you, you can look at the, the section that makes it mandatory to have insurance for building that is under construction or building in the course of uh, that's building under construction or an existing uh, building, and also the provision that makes it mandatory for you to take a professional indemnity policy, as I, I made reference to the clauses 218, 219, that makes it uh, mandatory that you are supposed to take a professional indemnity to cover uh, the, uh, the, negligent, the negligence, omission, and and the like for legal expenses and for, uh, uh, how do you call it, that's the, where there's work in progress and the like. So those comes up as uh, insuring courses under the uh, professional indemnity policy. And another question that came up was, how do these insurance impact our, our business? Uh, you, if you look at uh, the, the case study that uh, we had, if it's something that we could probably uh, go by, we could see that though they brought an action against the architect, there was some provision for, uh, that there was some provision in insurance that they were able to uh, use to mitigate against their losses. Though uh, the client bought an action of about 1 million, but then, uh, the, there was insurance for about two hundred thousand dollars, and so it means that if probably a project of one million is being done, and there's a professional indemnity of one million dollars that has been taken, then it means that the insurance could have covered for the whole uh, liability uh, amount. And then we are one question that came up was if claims on motor accidents are anything to go by. How soon are claims handed? That means that how soon are professional indemnity claims handed? There are claims in insurance, there are claims guidelines, uh, guidelines in claim settlement. And usually if all documents, all supporting documents to a claim are submitted to the insurance company, within five working days, insurance companies are supposed to pay a claim that had arisen. And then uh, there was a question that asked that, why don't insurance companies give you all possibilities and advice on best uh, policy? Uh, if this will relate to a professional indemnity for the various uh, clauses that I mentioned, where I spoke about 
the negligent act, error, or omission, or a negligent misstatement or representation, or a breach of duty of care in connection with carrying on the, your business, that could be one of the insuring clauses. If there is a, an aspect that should cover a dishonesty of employees of the insured perfect professional or persons engaged under a contract of service, this could also be, be taken where there is a loss of document or data, including the cost of replacement or reinstatement of data and the increased cost of working. Increased cost of working, probably there is, there is fire at the architect's office and you have to relocate at a, at a particular or another office, and you need to pay so as to have the, the, the work done because certain works have been done at the office before you come to the, to the site. Where the professional indemnity policy had made provision for increased costs of working, it will, it will, it's going to uh, cover this. It is going to take about six months to rent an office uh, at, at Osu because it is closer to the, the the project site so that you could complete uh, on time. Once there, there's a provision in the, in the policy, it will be done accordingly. And then cost of investigating and settling of a claim or legal cost, all these are insuring clauses under the policy that uh, the ins insurer is, some, is supposed to make this known to the architect so that you can take specific cover in respect of the professional indemnity insurance that you are looking for. Then again, there was a question on insurance companies should also educate as well on documents to provide before claims can be made and not only on, not only on benefit. Okay, if I, if I get this question very uh, properly, you are asking, we are asking, to know the document that you are supposed to submit in the event of a claim so that a claim can be uh, settled timely. Uh, I will say that as far as a uh, professional indemnity policy or professional indemnity insurance is concerned, it could, it could be done on case by case basis. Uh, it will not be uh, the same for every uh, case that will but then what is most important uh, when you take an insurance uh, policy, when a claim is intimated, you need to notify the insurance company. We call it notification of claim. Now, when you do a notification of a claim, the insurance company is supposed to respond to your notification. In their response, there are two things that the insurance company will do. The insurance company will say, look, for this notification that you've given us, uh, highlighting the, the approximate cost of the claim, uh, liability is admissible. Uh, give us documents A, B, C, D to uh, support your claim. And then they probably appoint something like a loss adjuster to look at it, uh, investigate it further, and then also check if the policy is in force and, and, and then how much uh, limits are under the policy before settlements are done. So the response to the insurance companies are two. Uh, they will say liability is admissible, give us document ABC. The or liability is not admissible. The claim had been uh, repudiated and they will give you reasons as to why the claims have been repudiated. So uh, you, you may not have uh, a straightforward document that you need to support to, or you have to submit to um, a, 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 to support a claim when it arrives. But then what is most important is to notify insurers of the claim. And then you need to narrate the circumstance of the, of the loss. And then insurers will ask you to uh, support you with ABC. What is most important is the notification because if the notification is not done, sometimes the claim will be uh, 
could be statute by. Usually, if you are supposed to notify insurance for a claim that is more than three years, and you rather uh, come to inform them after the three years, and it, uh, through investigation, it is ascertained that, oh, this happened about three years ago. Insurance companies may not pay their claim because they wouldn't have had any information available to enable them to investigate uh, into their claim. But then if within that three years, you have notified their insurers and their claim was not pursued, but then because it was, uh, the, the, the claim did not come up at that time, but then at the latter part, it has come up. When the notification was done, you can always revisit uh, that claim and it can be uh, looked at because there are, there are some claims, there are some claims that could be uh, notified, but then it, it will not uh, come up immediately. Some take a while or some take certain period before the, let me say they will resurrect. It's, 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 it's a bit latent. So you don't see it uh, immediately until such time has, as it comes up. But then the notification is important. If you have notified your insurers, you can at any point in time uh, intimate or resurrect uh, the claim and it cannot be treated as a uh, statute bar. And when you notify insurers for a claim, make sure you get a receipt for that to evidence that you notified and uh, insurers have acknowledged a uh, receipt. So at any point in time, you could uh, uh, still uh, pursue it once you notified uh, insurers of the, of the claim. So these are some few questions that I, uh, came up that uh, I've, I've looked at. Uh, the other aspect that I would like to uh, ask to go through is just the the, the proposal forms. The, we have proposal forms for all policies that you take. If it's a professional indemnity policy, if it is a fire and allied perils policy, if it is a, a public liability a policy. But basically, the information that is requested on a typical uh, proposal form. Uh, let's say if it's a professional indemnity, I will, I will, I will share the, the, the slides so that we can uh, have a look at. So for instance, uh, I'm sharing a slide on a typical professional indemnity uh, policy schedule. And some of the highlights on the schedule, uh, they have a typical policy number, the insured name. In this case, the insured name is not a personal name, but then the consulting or the practicing architects uh, firm, that is, what they ask for, the address, the uh, occupation, and then we look at the period of insurance, and then what is the scope of cover? Those are what I said is the insuring process. You need to spell out, I want to cover for A, B, C, D, and then it will be on the policy schedule. It asks for the insured persons, that is the, the partisan, uh, architects and the, and the team of architects in the particular uh, uh, firm, uh, you, they ask for the, the list and then their positions. But then on the proposal form, it asks more like how many years they've been in practice and their qualification and their like. But this is the policy schedule. Again, they'll, they'll ask you for uh, amount of indemnity, and we have the, the limit per occurrence and then in, in aggregate. 
that becomes the, in this case, you have about $200,000 for this particular uh, case. And then they tell you what the premium is going to be for a typical uh, professional indemnity policy. I will say the premium rates will vary, but then it will, it will be around, uh, let's say 0 0.45 to 0 0.65 maximum of the amount of indemnity is what uh, an insurance company uh, may charge. And the reason why I give the rate range is that usually uh, an, an architect or a firm can be in the, in the books of an insurance company. And if over the years, there hasn't been any, any claim, what they do is that they, tend to like give you some uh, rebates at, at renewal because of the, uh, the, the fact that there is a, a good track record for that practicing uh, firm. And then they will give you that uh, rebate. That's why I was giving a rate range. For a typical proposal form, they ask for the name and address of the firm, that's the practicing firm, the nature of business or occupation, you give the full name of each partner, qualification, when qualified and how long uh, they've been in practice, uh, practice and any uh, previously uh, practicing name. In, in some of the proposal form, they will even uh, ask you to uh, give the insurance company uh, a similar uh, practicing uh, firm for reference, you could, you could even be asked to give about two practicing firms in, in, the, in, the same, in a similar profession. That's also a practicing uh, architect. So, so the, the reason why insurance asks uh, for this is that uh, there could be a claim that could be intimated, but then they could also uh, subject it, they can outsource it to another uh, third party practicing architect to really uh, investigate into it so as to establish uh, liability. It could also serve as a source of reference where the insurance company want to know certain uh, issues relating to the practicing of uh, the, the uh, practicing of any consulting uh, architects. So they ask for uh, such uh, references. And then uh, you are told to uh, give, you are asked when the firm or company was established, you give a, a detailed description of what the firm does and uh, does the firm or company's practice extend or has extended to activities abroad, you, you, they ask you to respond as to whether it's yes or no, because here it could be of a, a geographical extension uh, cover. Uh, you are in Ghana, but your, uh, your practice uh, extends to uh, abroad, they, they need to know. And then it is you are asked what percentage of the of the of the firms or the company's uh, business is done uh, outside, and what is the method of handling uh, such uh, business? Uh, do you have uh, some partners who are there, or it's the the company outsource the, uh, the the practice or the work of the actors to a third party? Then they ask for the total indemnity required and states the specific nature of indemnity uh, required. Those are what I said, they are the insuring uh, clauses. They ask has any application for insurance of this nature made on behalf of the firm or company or their predecessors in business or any of the present partners or directors ever been declined is, is the, the insurance wants to know whether there has been any point in time when uh, 
the cover that you requested for had been declined, and for what reason was it uh, declined? It's a it's a material fact that uh, insurers would like to know. And that's why they will ask for such a question. So basically, uh, these are the questions that they will ask, and then you will give. Uh, you go to the what you call the declaration, where you say that all the information that you've given in respect of this uh, professional indemnity insurance request, uh, to the best uh, of your knowledge, is the is the is the truth. So it's a it's a form of declaration, and then uh, you you sign uh, for it, and it's been witnessed by any of the uh, processing partners. So this is a typical. Uh, professional indemnity policy. There is a sim there's a similar thing for uh, where you have a public liability insurance. Again, it's just like the name of the uh, proposal in food as if it is the, is the, uh, is the partisan firm, your business address, the business of proposal. It will ask about the nature of the work that you do, whether it it's involved the use of any uh, type of equipment and the like. If it's applicable, you say you say yes, and then it 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 asks uh, asks you uh, do you let or sublet any portion of of the business that's on the premises, whether it's is is part of a rented uh, apartment or you are not the only only um, firm that is. Uh, over there, and he asks whether you engage in any any work uh, from the premises, and if so, state general nature of such work and give the the details. These are more related to when the the professional engage engage in any form of uh, the use of plant and equipment on the premises or into manufacturing. In, in other words, what I'm trying to say is that on the proposal form, if a particular question is being asked and it does not relate to your work, you could just uh, skip it and probably say it's not applicable to your work. Again, they ask for the amount of indemnity here. They ask for the bodily uh, injury amount and then also for a property damage as uh, the the limits under the under the policy, and then they will work out the premium. It's, it's also an annual policy, which is, which is renewable. Again, if it's a building under construction or a building that is already existing, that for the uh, what I mentioned as the contractors or risk insurance, or if it's a commercial insurance, an existing building, and take the fire and allied perils insurance which could have a, the, the third party <clears throat> liability uh, components in it. They ask about the details of the, the building or if it's a building under construction, they, they ask you for the builder's work as probably if, you, if it's in the, in the BOQ, what is the contract sum? If there are contractors plant a machinery that is on the site and uh, if they are, if there are adjoining properties and the like on the, on the premises, you indicate them by way of value, and then you ask for the third party uh, liability limits, either per person and then property damage, and they use this to determine the, uh, the, the premium. So basically, these are the highlights of the uh, proposal form. And again, we have a typical, uh, professional indemnity policy, which I will, I will also uh, share with you. But basically, what the um, a typical professional indemnity policy uh, looks like is they, they usually have the uh, the operative clause. And what the operative clause usually says that you, the one who proposed for insurance after having paid the, uh, the commensurate premium 
or the appropriate premium, the insurance company are giving you a cover that will cover your professional negligence or the insuring clauses that uh, mentioned. And then the, the values of those cover that they are giving you will be, will be spelled out on the, on the shadow, the, the typical shadow that I showed you earlier on. So we have the operative clause and the, if there are some extensions, extensions, things covering like a, a legal liability or increased cost in, of work where you have to, like I give an example of uh, relocating an office or for a, a reason, let's say if the, it's, 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 it's a fire on the, on the premises and you have to uh, have a temporary uh, location, those extensions can be uh, looked at. They can be put on the policy as uh, extensions. Then we have the, the insurance firm's employees that's present and past uh, employees uh, are also covered under the, under the policy. So basically, a typical policy document will, will show what the policy covers and what not is covered under the policy. And then we have the policy schedule that spells out the limits under the policy. And then the period of cover that insurance company have granted. And then together with uh, the, the premium that, that is being paid and the like. So basically you have all these things uh, spelled out on the uh, policy schedule. And then if, there is a particular, some of the exclusions under the, what I mean by exclusions, that's what the typical thing that the policy does not cover. It's talking about the policy essence, that those ones are the deductibles under the policy. And then it talks about any claim or claims which the, the firm is entitled to any indemnity under any other policy. Uh, it, it means that if there's a specific policy that can address a particular uh, liability, uh, it may, you may not probably bring it under a professional indemnity policy. For instance, if it's a, a fire loss, you could claim it under a fire insurance. If it's a, a, a vehicle that run into a property and it's a motor insurance, you may not uh, claim it under a professional indemnity policy. So it could be covered under a more specific uh, policy, but basically, this one is supposed to cover the negligence of the uh, uh, the professional body or the the firm. There are there are some that talks about uh, geographical uh, extensions. If the policy is supposed to cover your operations or activities solely uh, within within Ghana it will exclude any other thing outside the country, unless uh, the policy has endorsed, has been endorsed to cover your patients outside, outside Ghana. So it, it's, it's very, very important that uh, if per your operation or your profession, you operate within uh, several jurisdictions and you are taking a particular uh, uh, professional indemnity policy to cover your, your work, you need to specify the jurisdictions within which you, you operate. So uh, then it talks about a uh, claim notification. That's when you are supposed to notify uh, an insurer in the event of a, of a claim. It's, it's, it's very important. And I spoke about the, the limitations. That's if where you're supposed to report a claim within three years so that it doesn't become a statute by. It's, it's very, very important, the, the claim notification. What I, what I would say is that the notification is very important. Sometimes you, you can notify a claim that you may not pursue it. It is better than to uh, assume nothing will happen and then later on when something happens, the, the policy might not have been 
uh, operational at the time that uh, the, that you can trace to the period that this uh, actually uh, happened. It happened more than three years ago, and it's it's now uh, 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 showing up. But then, if it is if it is something that is not latent, and you could, you probably uh, a client has raised an issue concerning your work, you could immediately notify the insurance company about some of these some of these claims, and then you are you are you are okay to. Go. It doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't matter if it's after the three years when it's uh, resurrects. So I would, I would, I would pause here because I I know I might have covered uh, most of the, the the areas, especially on the professional indemnity policy and then the fire alert perils and the public liability. Uh, insurance, so that if there are other uh, questions that we have to uh, look at together, then I'll, I'll pause here and then listen to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Anson Denchi. I have a question from an anonymous participant. Okay. Um, it says, how is the premium calculated and what happens to the premium if no claim is made? Okay, thank you very much. So what I said about the, the premium computation, uh, I spoke about the limits under the, under the policy. That is the limits under the policy is the cover that uh, you, you want for a typical uh, professional indemnity policy. So, for instance, if you ask for, let's say, one million dollar cover or one million Ghana cities cover, the maximum rate there's a rate that they apply on the aggregate limits. That's the limit for the whole year. The maximum uh, rate that you could come across is zero point uh, six five. But then uh, it's, not, it's not automatic. It could, it could come down to, let's say, 0.35% uh, thereof. But then uh, the question that you asked as to whether when there is no claim, what happened? Uh, I said during the presentation that uh, usually the insurance company look at your track record and if over the years, there hasn't been any, any claim. For instance, if they, they started with a rate of less than 0 0.35, and they realized that over the years, you have not been making any claim, they could come down up to, let's say, 0 0.275, 0 0.25% of the uh, aggregate limits because of the, of the track record. So it could be some form of discount that you, you would enjoy if there had been there hadn't been any claim and you've been in the good books of the insurance company for a long period. Wait, Thank I don't you know. very much. Thank you, Mr. Anson Denshi. I think I saw a hand up. Okay. If if you're ready, you can ask your question, please. Okay, so there's a question here which says, how does one determine the amount to be insured? Okay, so with, with that uh, in my presentation, uh, I, I said or I indicated that the usually the, the clients can uh, tell you that I want you to take a professional indemnity for this amount. And sometimes it could be guided by the let me say the, the contract sum. It could be a percentage of the contract sum, or it could be the full amount of the contract sum. Uh, if you look at the typical example that I gave about the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the Australian case, 
you you realize that the the owner bought the the property for about one point five million dollars, and uh, it took close to about one million dollars to uh, do the renovation works, and that was the amount of uh, liability that was brought against the architect. So here, yeah, if it can be ascertained that the contract sum for the refurbishment work was about one million dollars, and looking at this particular scenario, the architect are taking a cover for one million dollars, and it's truly what what had happened. That amount of uh, indemnity or aggregate limits could address the the claim. So usually, it will come from the from the client. But then there are, there are situations where it could be guarded by the contracts, the contract sum. And then if the, uh, the works states that you should take about 20% of the contract sum or 50% of the contract sum or the full amount of the contract sum, that would be the, uh, the how do you call it, the, the guide for you to take the amount that you have to take for the professional indemnity cover. Okay, thank you very much. And um, one more question that has come through. It says after paying the premiums for say 10 years and not making a claim, how does an architect get any benefits? Is there any cash back? Okay, uh, there is no cash back. But then uh, what, I, what I said was earlier on was that there could be some rebates by way of the rates that is, that is being applied on the, uh, the amount of cover, that is the indemnity limits that you have under the policy. Let's uh, say uh, you started about 10 years ago with uh, 1 million uh, Ghana cities. And uh, let, me, let me say at that point, the rate that was being used was about 0.5% uh, on that limit. And after 10 years, the, the amount of the aggregate limit that is being used on the policy is about, let's say, 5 million now, 5 million uh, Ghana cities. And there is a, a, a high possibility that the rate that will now be applied on the aggregate limit could be lower than the 0.5% that was applied initially on the 1 million uh, Ghana cities. I don't know if, if, if uh, I've, I've answered your question. I think it works just fine. I don't see any more questions here. So if you have your closing remarks, okay, hold on. A question just popped up. Okay. Oh, he says you didn't really answer the question. Oh, okay. So what, what, I, what, I, what I said was that uh, insurance doesn't give you a cash back. But then if over the years you have been doing the, uh, you have been taking the policy, the professional indemnity policy with, a particular insurance company, they will give you a rebate on the amount of indemnity that you'll be taking over the, over the years. It's just like uh, how uh, motor insurance uh, work. Let me just say a bit about it. There is something we call the no claim discount, NCD. Uh, and uh, NCD could go up to about 50% NCD. Uh, that's the no claim discount on the, of the premium that you were paying uh, initially, if over the years, each year, like let's say you have 25%, 30%, 35%, 45%, and then 50%. So in a, in a similar manner, if you started with a particular aggregate limit, and I said if a rate of about 5% or 0.5% was applied on 1 million, in about 10 years, now, if it's about 5 million now, the aggregate limit is about 5 million now, you could apply a rate of about, let's say 0.3% or 0.25% or 0.275%. It wouldn't be 
the 0.5 percent as it was applied on 1 million 10 years ago when it took the policy. And I don't know whether I have now answered <laughs> your, your question. Okay, so someone wants to know, is the insurance per project or for a period? If, if the insurance project... He's asking if the insurance is taking per project or for a okay. period of time. Oh, okay. So you, you could take one uh, professional indemnity policy to cover the projects that you have at, a, at any point in time. But then it, the, the quantum, that's the amount of uh, indemnity, the amount will depend on the number of, poly, uh, the number of projects that you have. Probably uh, uh, an architect with one project will take, let's say uh, 1 million or 5 million Ghana cities cover. And then one with about 10 projects should be able to take something like a, a 20 million uh, uh, cover so that the more projects that, that you have, you should have an adequate uh, insurance cover for uh, the, the projects in case there is any uh, mess up. Okay, um, so I think this is in reference to the previous question. A person says only a rebate, and then he says a rebate stops at 50%. After that, what happens? Is that a rebate code? It stops at 50%. And after that, what happens? Oh, yes. So, uh, uh, yes. So, I'm, I'm just saying that you could be given, I mean, uh, that was for the motor, the motor insurance. And like, it's still, it's still applied. You can, this is still applicable to, uh, how do you call it, like a professional indemnity policy. So, for instance, if it's from 0.5% uh, and the, uh, the, the limits have gone up and it comes to about, uh, let's say, 0.25%, which means that you have been given, uh, let me say, 50% over, over the years. And that is, that's the, that is what they could give you. But then elsewhere, depending on the, on the portfolio, like I'm saying, they could still revise the the this thing, the the, uh, the rates down. But then, what happens is that uh, there is something that I've not mentioned. I uh, will like probably there is something we call insurance of insurance. We call it re reinsurance. Usually, insurance companies get support from reinsurers. So sometimes you could quote a rate, and you may not get a, a reinsurance support. So you should be guided by uh, some of your reinsurance support so that in the event of a, of a claim, you could get, you could be cushioned by your, your reinsurance. So there, there is a, a rate at which they will not probably like to go uh, below because of the, the reinsurance uh, support. Now, if you look at a, a typical example that I, I gave, where you have about a $1 million uh, claim that was brought against uh, the, the architect, uh, you, you realize that if this particular architect had been in the books of the insurance company for about the last 10 years, and uh, let's say the rate that was given was from 0.5 and it triggered to about 0.25 at the time of the claim. What it means is, is that at the, at the next renewal, if this same architect is with the insurance company, after they've paid, let's say, this $1 million, uh, or which in this case, it was $200,000 that was paid. Subsequently, when the, the policy is being renewed at another, they, say they may probably hike the, the rates, if it was 0.25% that was used, they could use a rate of about 0.3 or 0.35% so as to uh, mitigate for their, their, their losses. On the side time that it, it stabilized and then they may probably come to 0 0.3, 0 0.25, 0 0.275.
Okay, thank you very much. And I have another question here that says, if I have 10 projects and one insurance indemnity, what happens if the aggregate for the claims exceeds the amount insured? Okay, so uh, I, I would still liken it to this Australian case that uh, the case study that we had. You will realize that uh, the uh, the client brought an action against uh, the architect to the tune of one million US dollars. But then you you realize that the insurance uh, policy that was in place was up to two hundred thousand US dollars. So it means that if the insurers had paid the client the two hundred thousand dollars, and the client had put in a claim to the tune of one million dollars, then it means that there's a, a shortfall of eight hundred thousand. Uh, US dollars. What it means is that if the, the cover that you have taken is not adequate to address the amount of claim, it means that the difference will have to be borne by the architect. Uh, literally, literally, that's what it means. That's why I, I said usually you have to take, make sure that you take an adequate adequate uh, cover so that it will be able to mean that the insurance can pay up to a point. It wouldn't pay more than the limit under the policy. Hmm. Okay, one more question here it says, how popular or how often do architects take professional indemnity insurance? And how do you see it playing out in the immediate future? Okay, the we we if you go through the the if you take the statistics from uh, insurance uh, companies, uh, I would say we you have to to some extent it's not as much as it is is anticipated, and I I know usually uh, architects that take uh, professional indemnity probably will come from the conditions of contract that's. Uh, ask them to uh, take a uh, professional indemnity policy. Uh, apart from that, they usually don't uh, uh, take professional indemnity policy. But uh, with the with the, with the new insurance bill, the 2020 makes it uh, mandatory that professionals of this data are supposed to take uh, professional indemnity for their operations. Thank you very much. Uh, one more question here. At times, clients just ask for a PI cover without stating the amount. Also, the firm may be handling a number of projects. So what do you, what do you insure for? I didn't, I didn't get your question, your question very well. It says, at times, clients just ask for PI cover without stating the amount. Also, the firm may be handling a number of projects. So what do we insure for? Okay, so uh, usually if an, an insurance company had uh, given you a cover, uh, insurance company cannot give a, a cover without uh, stating the limits under the policy. Definitely there'll be a limit under, under the policy. So. What I would rather uh, say is that the, uh, the architects should take a critical look at the policy, especially the policy schedule, and you see the limits under the, uh, under the policy on the, on the schedule. So it's not just that uh, you are paying a, a premium without knowing what you are, you are being covered for. Or probably uh, I, if there is an intermediary, like a broker who is acting on your behalf, uh, probably the, uh, the broker could have proposed a certain amount to the insurance companies to uh, give you a cover, and then it is based on that that they pay the premium. So certainly there is a, there is a limit under the policy that you are, you are being covered for. Right. I don't see any more questions here. So 
unless you have something else to add to what you've already presented. Yeah, so uh, I want to thank you very much for the opportunity and I want to edge all our... Uh, um, not to cut you, Mr. Denchi, uh, last question. Okay. By law, is it compulsory for an architect or professional to take professional indemnity in Ghana? Yes, please. Uh, with, the, with the new uh, insurance bill, the 2020 insurance bill, it's, it's mandatory. Those, that's where I quoted the section the 218219, uh, that makes it mandatory for uh, all professional architects uh, to take professional indemnity policy for their operations. And it goes for all the, the professionals, the doctors, the architects, the engineers, the quantity surveyors, and uh, all that. Once you hold yourself as a professional uh, body, uh, you are supposed to take a professional indemnity to cover your patients. All right. Thank you. So forgive me for earlier. You were saying. Yeah, so I want to thank you very much for the opportunity and I, I want to urge all our fellow uh, activists uh, to take professional indemnity insurance for their operations. There are several insurance companies in the, in the country. For instance, you could be guided by your motor uh, insurer. You ask yourself, oh, which insurance company covers my motor insurance? Is it SIC, is it Glyco, is it Downwell, is it Star? Let me talk to a broker or let me talk to them to find out uh, what uh, quotes can they give me for a particular uh, professional indemnity uh, policy that I want to take. And I also want to advise that whenever you take any insurance policy and you have any challenges uh, with, uh, with claims or any other thing, they, that is why we have the regulator, the National Insurance Commission. You, you, can, you can report to the National Insurance Commission uh, for, for regress. Uh, because the essence of uh, taking any insurance uh, cover is that one day there'll be a claim. And when there's a claim, the uh, insurers are supposed to uh, readily come to your, to your aid so that it doesn't give uh, the uh, insurance uh, industry a very bad uh, perception in the eye of the the, the, the public. So I want to urge you that uh, as we've done this uh, engagement, uh, the National Insurance Commission is there because of the, the public and to make sure that when there are legitimate claims that uh, you've taken an insurance policy for, the insurance company will readily come, will respond to the claim when it, it arises. But thank you. You're welcome. We would also like to say a very big thank you for taking time of your busy schedule to come educate us on this very important topic. Thank you all participants for being here this afternoon, spending your data. I hope it has been worth it. Thank you very much and see you soon on the next CPD. Thank yeah. you. So I'll share the listing with uh, Abby Collins uh, and Nancy. Right. right. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Good evening.